the first of the great medieval battles I'm going to tackle is, of course, the not really historical King Arthur, but I do things in chronological order always. And, well, all right. Um, oh, by the way, like a lot of the games that SPI put out, it would be a nice little uh, historical booklet. I haven't read it yet. Um, I don't expect that there's much in here that I'll find terribly interesting to me. The Battle of Angora. Um, anyway. It, these really excited me when I was, you know, reading the magazines, the S&Ts, getting the historical info on them. But then, uh, and I'll read that, but... Uh, it's just the era and the level of detail that it's going to be at. I don't expect to get too much additional information. Anyway, let's go uh, with the specific rules for King Arthur, which are a little detailed, uh, and then we'll jump into playing. So first of all, in addition to whatever we already know, um, cavalry units cannot charge through or into a barrel, megalith, altar, or ditch. Nor may they charge through a ridge hexide. Uh, there's the barrel and the megalith. Ridges and ditches. Basically, I can't go over any terrain <laughs> uh, with a charge. Um... I don't think that needs to actually be specified because it's supposed to be three clear hexes. Uh, and I think you're allowed to make charges otherwise. Ditch to ridge melee. If you melee across a ridge from a ditch, you add two to the die roll. Remember, that's going to be a penalty. Pagan shrines. If a pagan unit is in a barrel, megalith, or altar. I don't know where altars are. Ah, there's the altar. Okay. In the middle of Stonehenge. Uh and they have to make a morale check, they add one to the die roll. Now that's actually a good thing. The morale effects table you want high. Um, and if a Christian is in one of those, they take a penalty of one. Uh, we have some new counters here. These are gonna be to resolve uh, the hand-to-hand the -hand combat. There's also stun markers. Uh, which is also part of the hand-to-hand. -hand. I didn't see any. I don't know. I, I'm sure it has a game turn marker. I, I've got it all sorted out. I, like, I bought it. It was in the tray, and I left it in the tray because I intended to get to it soon, and it's probably been over a year since I bought it. Uh, Archibus convinced me I wanted to finally get to this. Okay, Saxon units have the ability to enter a leaf shield wall during Mordred's movement phase. This is going to be the climactic battle between Arthur and Mordred. Uh, if at any time during the movement phase a Saxon unit enters, leaves, or remains in shield wall, the unit's movement point allowance is reduced to one for that phase. Uh, they can attack and defend normally. Yeah, sort of. If we look at them... They keep the same armor, their movement allowance goes down to one, but they go up to an A morale, which makes them significantly better at fighting, actually. Uh, they never move during route movement phase, regardless of their route level. Instead, they'll take additional route levels as long as they're there. Now, I don't remember if routed units could attack. I assumed they couldn't, but I'm not sure that's true. I don't see any prohibition there. I will have to look for that more carefully, but I don't think that you're prohibited from attacking when you're in route status, which means the shield wall units standing there can keep, you know, fighting. And it kind of makes sense because if your route's prevented, you would keep fighting although there's probably a penalty against him. But there isn't in the game that I know of. Okay. Uh, leaders. Um, so leaders have two values to them. The first number, the five in the case of Arthur, is his prowess. And the second is the chivalry rating. 
Any leaders with a chivalry rating of zero are paid leaders. Oh, for what that affects. There are no movement allowances on the leaders. The leader is going to have the same movement allowance as the fastest unit in their contingent. Now, Arthur, fastest unit in his contingent is the Knights of the Round Table at 16. Everyone else has slower units. So like the Saxons, they're going to be on foot with a, you know, a movement of six. Uh, the Scots and the Irish and the Picts are all going to have whatever movement that these missile guys have. It looks like eights, except for the Irish, who are faster because they aren't using bows. And then uh, these are the evil Britons. They have a movement of 12. They're essentially the same as the good Britons in plate armor. Because it's not really all that historical. Okay. Uh, the big thing with the, this rule set is that you have man-to-man -man combat, which is that a leader can challenge a leader he's adjacent to to combat. And then that's fought out in a series of rounds, and then when it's done, uh, when, when that uh, particular melee is done, then you go on and the next challenge can be handled if there are more in place. Um, before each round, you may yield your leader, in effect surrendering him. If you don't yield the leader, then you'll fight the battle and you'll just keep getting that option. Do you want to yield or do you want to fight? Um, each leader can only make one challenge, uh, regardless of whether or not there's a duel from it. If you're hidden, you may not challenge. We'll talk about hidden in a moment. Okay, pagan leaders, yeah, we'll talk about it now. Pagan leaders, when they're challenged by a Christian leader, uh, they have the choice to either accept the challenge or hide. They can't yield. You know, why would they want to? If they hide, they're placed with the troop, underneath the troops that they're with. If they're not with troops, they can't hide. Uh, and if you've challenged or engaged in a man-to-man -man combat, you can't hide. If you're hidden, you'll be hidden for that man-to-man -man combat phase and then for the two following melee phases. Well, that's the current player and the non-phasing player's melee phase. Um, so it, it's basically until the next player turn. So combat units which have a hiding leader in them have a penalty of one on their morale table, and then they crawl out from under their rock after the melee phase. So the way combat resolution is going to be handled is that you end up picking a chit for your attack zone and a chit for your defense zone. And basically you're going to have these four chits, helm right, left, and horse legs. So here's a left. So you'll have a sword for left, that's your attack counter, or a defensive left. And likewise, you'll have the same with horse legs. Okay, and there's a defense on that. And you'll have all four of them. Now, we have all kinds of interesting things here. I'm gonna sort these a little better. Uh, but anyway, each player selects an attack and a defense, keeping it hidden from their opponent, and then they reveal. And that's going to give the base value. So, for example, if I attacked horse legs and you defended left, and yeah, they're all the same color, uh, we'd look here, and it would have a base value of 5. I add a die roll to that, and any modifiers here. And that brings me to the man-to-man -man effects table. And that'll be the effect, and it could be bad for the attacker if the, if the total is low enough. It could be uh, an effect on the defender otherwise. And we're both resolving at the same time, essentially. Now, if the die roll is a one, it's not possible to hurt 
uh, the defender. You can only hurt yourself with that. Uh, anything else there? Yeah. Uh, if you are chivalry two or higher, you can't aim for horse or leg legs. Um, some of the effects are things like, hey, you break your lance, or you break your lance on a, uh, or on a horse, um, or wounded, or, or whatever. What are the effects of these? Well, first of all, the mounted and lance, those are affected, they affect the modifiers in your man-to-man -man combat rating. In addition, stunned, which is a result, affects the modifier. And I believe if you're stunned, you can't attack. And wounds affect the modifiers. Wounds, when you take a wound, your leader is flipped over to the wounded side. And this doesn't affect anything in play except for the man-to-man -man combat. Uh, but it is permanent for the scenario. Stun is just for the next round. Uh, unhorsed or broken lance is theoretically for the remainder of the single man-to-man -man combat you're fighting in. After that, if you've ever played Pendragon, you know this, you make your squire roll and your squire comes up and gives you a new horse or lance. <laughs> there are some uh, effects to this though. If you have a chivalry of two or greater uh, and you still have a, an intact lance and you break your opponent's lance or your opponent breaks his lance, then you have to give him the right to go back and get another lance. If you have a chivalry of three or higher, and you're still on your horse, if your opponent is unhorsed, you have to give him a chance and he is allowed to go get another horse. Uh, you get these back at the end of any duel. A stun only lasts in the current duel, and again, you can't attack, you get a penalty on defense. Uh, before any round of duel, before you select your chits or whatever, you're allowed to yield, and that makes you captured. If you're captured, you're just being carried around by another leader or a unit. Um, and if that other leader is defeated in hand-to-hand, -hand com in, in man-to-man -man combat, and he's got you under him, you're released. If a unit is destroyed and you're captured under it, you're released. You can't immediately do a challenge when you're released, but otherwise you're pretty much functional all the way around. Uh, we have different nationalities. Leaders can only affect troops of their own nationality in terms of rallying. Uh, victory, it's just gonna be a bunch of points. So plate units are worth 10 each. All other units are worth two. Saxons are worth 10. Arthur's worth 50, Mordred and Shalric are worth 25 each, each other leader's worth 10, and I believe whoever has the most victory points wins, right? Uh, the game is a victory for King Arthur if the total of King Arthur's victory points minus the total of Mordred's exceeds 20, otherwise the Mordred player wins. Okay, so Arthur has a penalty against him. Now, Arthur has a lot more leaders on the board and I don't know how good his troops are comparatively, but I mean, if we look, we can see. So these guys are B quality in general with A's here. They're about equivalent to this. The Saxon line is the only thing um, that you could say is a possible edge for the Mordred player. And if you just count units, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're equivalent. But the Saxons are only good when they're in their uh, um, shield wall. Otherwise, they're kind of crappy units that probably will fail their morale. They can start the game in shield wall. I haven't set them up that way, but I will. Uh, however, Mordred has more missile units, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how it all, all kind of plays out. Looks like I found the game turn marker. Ah, sorted out these guys. There's a bunch that aren't going to be used here, so the lances won't be used. Disobeyed in charge as well. These stuns, broken lances, and uh, unhorsed are here or there for 
this one in particular, and we'll fish out what we need. I think the special things for this are only for this, but we'll see. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep each battle, uh, no matter what, I'm gonna keep each battle in its own bag, and I think I can keep these counters in with this one. So, Mordred goes first, and let's talk about what uh, he wants to do. The Barrow is a useful place to be. The terrain effects chart doesn't tell us much, so like the ridge isn't terribly valuable. It's more expensive to cross. Its effect is really only if I'm coming out of a ditch, so only if um, you're trying to defend inside Stonehenge in a really bad location, do you get a problem with that? If we move, the ridge costs one extra movement point, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can get up to there. That doesn't really help me. If I could get to the barrow, that would be useful. But at the very least, I can close range and make it difficult for those knights to attack. Unfortunately, if I do that, I can't be in shield wall. They won't be able to charge. Uh, the knights won't be able to charge, but I won't be in shield wall. I don't know which to take. Uh, I think I'm going to move forward. Uh, let's see. These Britons are Christians, so they're not going to be benefiting from the barrow. I would really like to get into uh, the barrow, hexes, and the megaliths and all that, but... I don't see where that's going to be very possible. So we'll move. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll get the rest of these up too. I think I'm doing this right. <laughs> Let's check our sequence of play. Yeah. Now these guys have a movement of eight. They're armed with bows. Which means we have a range of three. And as long as we stay there, we're okay. Let's move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Move them up a little bit. That looks like a dangerous place to be. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, I don't know what to do with these picks. I'll slide them over here. Get these bowmen or slingers. Slings only have a range of two. Oh, these picks have poison bows, which same range, more likely to do damage. Uh, ridges, ditches. Okay, the ridge gives us an extra point to cross. Where's the ridge? The ridge is here. From the ditch. Oh, the ditches line this. So they actually, this is a raised walkway, which makes sense. Um, just fling these forward and we'll get more dread up to here. His forces. Okay. Well, we have a little bit of missile fire going on. Um, nothing's in range except some of these Scots here. I've got two Scots that can shoot at those Britons. Now they're in plate armor, so that's not gonna do much, and I don't have a die. I'll be back in a moment. Right, let's resolve a couple of these shots. I can't find my old Avalon Hill dice, nor I don't know if they're here, my old SPI dice, the tiny ones. Uh, the Avalon Hill ones, I'm pretty sure are. They're probably over in that pile there, but I, they're not exposed. <laughs> um, yeah, it takes me a while to unpack. 
expect this for years. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So I've got two bowmen shooting at plate armor. Let's see how that works out. And we're not going to do this every time. They're at the long range. Plate armor two through four. There's no modifiers. It's not against the charge. So our first shot is not a success. And our second shot. Oh, maybe. Nope. Okay. Uh, we run down through the rest of this. And there's no melee or anything. So now we're on the Arthur side. And I'm going to have to think a little. Because in this kind of war game, reserves are just sort of a nice to have, <laughs> you know. Hey, somebody falls back, I got somebody to plug the hole with. But I don't think that they're as big an advantage as overwhelming the opponent. I'm going to do the following. One, two, three, four. Now I'm doing a flank attack here, so it's not the best thing in the world, but one, two, three. Four. Oh, these are all going to be flanked. No, this isn't. I can attack here without a problem. Um, and likewise, I can try to make some space here. One, two, three, four. Uh, five, six. One, two, three. Kind of wouldn't, don't particularly want to be in the barrel. If I'm there, my guys get a little spooked. So we'll leave a hole there. One, two, three, to there. Uh, none of these are charges. I may want to set my leaders up so that they're better able to affect enemies. Here I get an attack. Here I probably don't really want one. This is Sagamore. He's like, you know, really very chivalrous, but not very good. <laughs> and that's kind of the problem I have across a number of these. So like here, I probably want to be in that space instead just look at some of the others Sagramore I'm kind of stuck fighting with him uh, and now let's get our reserves into place one two three four five six seven eight sounds good one two three give me some space there why am I not moving leaders off I don't know one two three four Five, six, seven. We'll face them just because it makes us happier to do that. We'll move an extra space. That'll get me more firepower down here. And over here, I think we want to keep this flank somewhat refused. Because I'm a little worried about crappy slingers. Uh... That's moving in the ditch. Ditches are just one. I'm not crossing the ridge. So. We'll just give a little bit of room there. All right. So that has done our movement. Now we hit simultaneous fire. Well, we have some fire here. Let's take care of that first. And yeah, I'm playing everything out for you. It's a simple game, right? Uh, poisoned arrows at range three versus plate mail is two through six. Okay, so I get a morale check against these. I just want to show you some of the mechanisms in play. So that's a B morale unit there. And any modifiers? I don't see any. So I roll a die, and I get a crappy one, which is going to be an R2. And that means he's got bigger problems. 
uh, as he engages, etc. He's going to have uh, more difficulty. Now, as soon as you route, I don't think you go running back. But maybe I'm wrong. I'll stop and look. I believe you route immediately, but I was wrong about one thing. Uh, over here, routed units may not engage in fire combat, melee combat, or normal movement. Yes, they can be fired upon or meleeed, though. All right, so that's uh, a shot over there. Let's go over to this side. Now, over here, we have more bowmen, and we'll shoot at these Britons in front of us. That's regular bow instead of poison bows, but at range one, that's a two through five against plate. No. I kind of like the idea of shooting up the units in plate. So, uh, let's see if we can hit him again. We do not. We'll shoot this one. We do not. We have one more guy to shoot. I'll shoot at uh, these leather armored bowmen, uh, which is two through six. That doesn't work. Now we'll go through all of these. Now the effects wouldn't have taken place yet. Um, from what I can see here, I'm going to make two shots at that one. Well, let's do the first shot. This is bow range two. This is against male bow. These Saxon bowmen are mailed. Two through five. We'll shoot him again. Wow. Uh, we'll shoot the guy on the end because, I don't know. We don't want to shoot at range three for some reason. And we'll shoot at range three on him because it's more likely to hit the bowman than it is the other thing. So that's a hit. This has a morale of lousy D. Roll a die. Four. It's going to get a route one. Over here. Okay. Right then. Now we hit the sequence of play again. And, hmm. When does man to man combat happen? Is it before fire combat? Uh, there's certainly going to be some man to man combat here. I just forgot about it. Immediately after fire. So we did it in the right place. So at this point, we'll start looking down the line and seeing who wants to challenge you. And this guy, I'll challenge him. I don't know who we got here. Eguissant versus Brunig. Brunig's going to hide. That's going to affect his unit's um, capabilities. But that's okay. Over here, uh-oh, Shedrick is going to attack uh, Karadok. Now, Karadok cannot hide. He could yield immediately. He doesn't want to do that. What I'm going to, he's not chivalrous. He only has a one chivalry. So he's able to uh, attack at the horse's legs. So what I'm going to do is kind of randomize exactly what I'm doing um, because it is really completely random here. So we'll see what his attack is. He's going to pick a left attack, and this is normally done secretly, and a right defense. Okay. And now over here, we will pick a right attack. Uh, and a helm defense. Okay, so now we can, and obviously I'm rolling more dice than I would normally need to, uh, just to make up for the fact that I can't fairly choose. Um, but I think random is probably close enough. So let's look at this. I'm making a left attack against helm. Well, let's look at the, this one first. Right attack against right defense. That should give me a zero, but it gives me a seven. Hmm. Right attack against, oh, against, right attack against right defense gives us seven. 
Okay, that is not what I would assume. <laughs> Maybe this chart is not as accurate as I, you know, as correct as I would have thought. Um, right then, I don't know what to say. Uh, so anyway, I've got a seven for some reason. Now the attacker and defender are both mounted. The attacker has an unbroken lance that gives him plus one. That brings him to eight. And nothing else, plus a die roll. That brings him to a 13, and I think there must be something wrong there. He's going to be stunned, unhorsed, and wounded. Um, that will be who Karadok is now stunned, unhorsed, and wounded. And when you're unhorsed, you break your lance automatically. Uh, but you could get it back. Okay. Now, the other side is left versus helm. Now, I thought right versus right was going to be really lousy. Left versus helm is a base of only four. Yeah, I don't know. Because left versus left is a seven. Left versus right is the zero. But right versus left, because the shields on your left arm isn't as good. So this may take more thought than I've been looking at. But anyway, we had a seven mounted. No, unbroken lance puts me to eight. And none of the other factors are in play yet. So we get an eight, uh, a 13, which is the same thing. Stunned, unhorsed, and wounded. Oh, we forgot to wound them both. Okay. Eh. Eh. Uh, he swung at plus two, which is 15, or no, at minus two, which means he's actually 11. Stunned and unhorsed is all it is, not wounded. Uh, Karadok is wounded. I forgot to take their strengths into account. Karadok is wounded, and actually it's more than that. He's killed. So we will put him in the dead pile. So that was a successful battle uh, for the mortared side. Right, we keep looking. Uh, this dude will attack Sagramore, and uh, I'll come back after uh, all the effects are taken care of because I'm running low on battery. I might need to swap and then give some charge time. Us or whatever his name is got the advantage on Sagramore. Sagramore tried to yield. Elos said, screw that. He's a pig and he doesn't have to follow it. I think you only have to follow if you have chivalry to or higher, uh, but I'm not sure. Maybe any, any Christian has to accept. Uh, and so he killed him. <laughs> uh, and then over here, the pagan again hid. So now we go to the melee and the moving player gets to do his melee first. Melee is just an attempt to hit. There's no harm in doing it. So, we'll attack the Scots. We are in plate, attacking male. On a two through eight, we force a morale check. We succeed. He's got a lousy morale of D. No modifiers on it. A D at two is a route of two. Okay. Now over here, I might as well hit this. It's got a penalty to its morale due to the leader there, and again, it's plate against the nail. And you can see, I mean, this isn't like Great Battles of History or even like the Men of Iron series. Uh, although the combat's probably about equivalent to Men of Iron. But it doesn't have the same command control uh, stuff going on in it. Still, this was the best there was when I saw it. You know, well, maybe not. I mean, things like pre-stags, people still say that's pretty good. Uh, plate, I, I don't know. Plate versus mail, I get a hit. That's a morale of D with a penalty. Uh... I 
minus one, five. He gets a route of one. So I'm hitting a center faced unit. Uh, now we go to this one. Well, I might as well hit the leader because I can remove his capability for rallying, right? Uh, so I've got uh, plate versus mail again. And these guys are not uh, in shield wall. They chose to charge forward instead. I get a hit. C morale. I wasn't able to charge. But I do get an R1 on them. And that's going to send them flying back. This guy. This guy, I'll swing at the guy in front of me. Again, plate versus mail. And I think we can back away for a bit. I forgot to do, I dropped a disobeyed marker on the leader who affected uh, the, who, who got not hit, but uh, whose unit broke under him. Now remember, the melee is sequential. So now the second player gets to melee, but he's got a lot less units. So now I've got a mail. I think I'll hit a plate and see what I can do. Might get lucky. Flip through the charts. Mail versus plate is only a two through five. Uh, that's not gonna hit. Gotta avoid all of these. This guy, he'd be attacking through a plank, through a flank, which gives a plus two. So he's only on a two through three. We'll try to hit this one. Might as well go for the leader, right? Yeah, might as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, here, it's a two through five because it's a center hex. Doesn't work. And. Center hex is this one. Center hex is that one. Center hex is over here. And we get no hits. Okay. That puts us now to the next turn. And the next turn is going to start with route removals. But uh, the leaders who are under routed units, except over here, are all, no, he should be too, right? How did he get, yeah, are all disobeyed. I just haven't marked them all. So we're gonna pull those disobeyed markers off. Now, I've got some leaders that I've got hiding. They came out from hiding before they got disobeyed. But they're losing their disobeyed here. So let's look uh, at the units. They'll have to retreat at this point. And the retreat is, if your movement is six or less, you retreat one per route point that you have. So this will pull back one. This will pull back two. I don't have to take the leader, but I probably want to. I don't really care. Facing doesn't matter uh, once you're routing. Over here. Okay, these guys are horses. They move two per. So they're coming one, two, three, four, fleeing that way. And these guys are infantry. Just pull them back a space. And none of them rallied. And now we hit Mordred's movement. And things don't look good for him. I have to put some thought into what I'm going to do. Uh, but I'm probably going to try to pick off some more of these Arthurian heroes. Red's positioning his strongest missile units over here. Try to clear things up here. He's got his slingers in enough numbers. He's hoping to overcome 
the situation. Maybe get a defensive position back here where he gets some certain advantages. Um, all the Saxons went into shield wall. And the ones that are still there, <laughs> you know. Um, the others, I'm positioning leaders so that I can try to rally stuff. Uh, I think this is the best I can do. I can't rally everything. I've got one charge going. These guys had to kind of sidestep to get in there. Now they're going to be attacked. But the, it's okay to be attacked from the flank. It's just attacking without hitting that center front hex is a penalty. However, first we have the missile fire. Simultaneous fire combat's a little painful to handle, as it often is. Um, anyway, we've got, uh, this one's got blown back, but the charge is going to succeed. Uh, over here, a disobeyed marker there. He's going to be fleeing. Uh, and you can see the bowman that uh, Arthur has on his left flank kind of got pieced by the sheer quantity that was coming in there. Now we go to the man-to-man, -man, but before we do that, i got to brew myself another cup of tea. It's outstanding pagan leaders in the front. Continue to wipe up the kind of lousy Arthurian uh, leaders that are available. The good ones haven't been hit hard, you know, but I'm racking up a lot of points. Those guys are 10 points each. <laughs> so far, they're the only thing's dead. So, you know, if I could, uh, if I could call the battle here, I, I'd win. Of course, if I could call the battle before it started, I'd win. But that brings us now to uh, the melee phase. And this is going to be the more dread player melee. You know, it's kind of useful. A couple of important things, mainly the morale table, is sitting here letting me uh, it's got all the morale effects. Um, let, uh, modifiers. Letting me uh, not have to flip back and forth. The only time I have to do it is the man-to-man -man combat where there's the results over here. But otherwise, everything I need is right in front of me between those two rule books. At the end of Mordred's turn, you can see inflicted a little bit more damage here. Actually didn't manage to dislodge those, which is kind of painful. Um, so now we go to the Arthurian turn. Be nice if this was double-sided, given that they spend on double-sided printing. Which means it's route removal. And we look at the leaders who are not disobeyed. And we recover units from those. Notice this guy almost died. That was, uh, I think, all on one hit. Well, it already had Archer fire on it um, but he came close and now we have to retreat the units that are still demoralized and there's no zones of control in this uh, I gotta check the movement value on that um, I thought it was six but I I don't want to guarantee it yep six Six goes up to two, so he's got, well, above six goes up to two. So he's got four, so he's going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, you know, he's essentially gone anyway. Um, likewise, this guy, one, two, three, four, just run away. Uh, these guys are fast. And so on. This position's looking pretty uh, precarious right now. And not only is he down 20 points, he can't charge with his good units. I mean, he could about face and run away. That may be the best move he's got and try to reform his forces because uh, 
I don't like this weight of shield wall. I'm having trouble bashing my way through it. They're higher quality than I am for morale, which means it's really hard to move them. They'll just start disintegrating. <laughs> like they can't attack back if they start taking route hits. Um, and unless a leader gets to them, they will just fall apart. But <laughs> this flank over here is pretty much gone. And over here, I feel like the preponderance of Mordred's weights hitting in terms of the cav, etc., is in place uh, to fill in any gaps that the archers have left place way. And I think my best move is probably to fall back and try to form another line and charge. The problem is the more territory you give up, the closer you are to your retreat edge and the more likely your routes are going to start overwhelming you. Of course, if you weren't short on leaders, and I don't feel like they are, they, they've got a fair number of leaders, but if you weren't short on leaders, you could uh, very easily um, rally most of the units that you take hits on, as long as you have enough space to retreat a little bit. So I'm going to give a little bit of ground here and see what that means for Mordred. The problem with that is, of course, Mordred doesn't have to attack. He's got the victory point bonus, and Arthur's got to win by 20. <laughs> so uh, I am going to have to launch an attack at some point, and if I give up the barrow and the hill and such not, eh, I mean, does the ridge actually affect anything here? I think the ridge only affects if you're attacking out of a ditch, so that's not a big deal. But uh, the barrel gives him a little morale edge. Um, and likewise, if I end up having to give up Stonehenge, I've got some serious problems. And after a little bit of Poison Bowfire, <laughs> which wasn't effective at long range, this is where we're at after that. Now, Mordred has some problems too. He's got forces that are going to be running, and he's got to track them down and run them, and then try to uh, reorganize his forces into what he thinks is a good defensive position. He probably doesn't need terribly to worry about advancing at this point. I made the advance before to try to get, you know, into the good terrain. Well, I'll move forward a hex, basically, with my shield wall, and then hope that the charges break on it. Um, and probably keep my cav back. But we'll see. We'll see how I can reform, because Arthur's got a rally... You know, he's got forces rallying all over the place, and it's not clear. Maybe maybe I'll try to pick this guy off, at least with some archers, you know, why not? Now, with leaders not having much effect in the game, yeah, they can go man-to-man -man combat, and that's been important, you know. At least the lousy ones should be off rallying things all the time. So it doesn't provide the same conundrum that uh, Great Battles of History does where, hey, I need my leaders to activate units, but I can't let these guys keep routing off the map. I've already gone through the rally, and obviously Arthur's side rallied where Mordreds didn't because it's the Mordred player turn. Um, they've already had their opportunity. <coughs> For the most part, I mean, it's possible to rally in the off phase. There's no question of that, but with Arthur pulling back, that meant there weren't any casualties, really. Um, so anyway, uh, that's kind of sad. I kind of wish they had a leadership uh, importance on the board. Maybe not absolutely vital because, hey, if all your leaders got stripped, your army would dissolve. But on the other hand, uh, maybe that's about right, <laughs> you know? Uh, anyway, I'll try to figure out where Mordred's going. His deployment ended up more or less like I thought last night. Big defensive screen here. Um, pushing forward with the archers on the flank there. His cav a little further back. Not far enough back to prevent them from being charged, but you know, that would be pretty hard to do. Um, I probably should have set them back a little bit more because flank attacks don't really matter and you don't really have to protect things. You could protect them with the cav being behind. So if Arthur's cav charges, then Mordred's char could charge. 
The one thing that I'm starting to do though, I'm starting to pluck lousy leaders and not leave them on the front line. They really shouldn't be there. They don't do me any good. There aren't very many lousy Arthurian leaders left. A couple of them. And then over here, slingers, trying to pick on these bowmen. Uh, running way away from their leader, who's all the way back here. I think some command and control roles would greatly help this, and I would probably introduce them if I play it again. The first unit destruction of some bows here got killed by the slinger they were already routing and chased down. <coughs> also, this front knights got hit. This got hit. The line is just collapsing pretty hard. There's not going to be any challenge combat or melee, so we go to the Arthurian side. We launched a massive charge. You can see almost all the cav is charging. Only the round table is hanging back. And of course, a lot of the great glorious knights are hanging back too. Uh, however, I did pick out a couple of places where I have an advantage, and I'm going to try to score points on those. Um, that advantage may not be so great that it's worth hiding, because this is the big attack. So, you may see uh, Mordred's knights actually standing and fighting. But first, the missile fire. And Bowes did a remarkably good job on the knights there. And I have to admit, I forgot the defender's charging penalty there. I probably should take away one of those two hits. Let me see which one. Let's get rid of this one and replace it with a charge because I'm pretty sure they both weren't in the two through five range. I mean, those things still hit on a two through seven against the plate, but the charging penalty was in there. I'm pretty sure one of them missed. I just don't know which one. Uh, so now we go to the personal combat. I don't know quite what I'm going to do. I mean, whether I'm going to stand and take it or take the penalty on the morale. The problem with taking the penalty on the morale is these things have a lot of trouble once they're engaged, like, and routed. And a pretty ugly battle going on here between these two guys. Uh, they're within one point of each other. Mordred's ally there, Elos or whatever, has been out picking. In part maybe because he has an additional attack available. Uh, the And I, I think he's using that less cleverly than maybe he should, but I don't want to play knowledge of the percentages into any of this. Anyway, um, so I'm just leaving my patterns as they are. If he played knowledge of percentages, knowing that the defender um, is actually fairly unlikely to pick the horse legs. It, it, it just, I don't know. Anyway, um, as it is, he's been getting an advantage off of the distribution of the things, um, but he's the disadvantaged leader. Uh, however, he's got the advantage right now unhorsed and stunned, but even that's not enough uh, to get us into the, yeah, we're going to actually kill the guy <laughs> or wound him even. Um, we haven't been able to get to that high a level. And it's got to end up with a perfect pick. And it's possible he might recover. Um, it is a, a pretty rich, you know, in terms of the narrative that's coming out of it. But when you go for too rich a narrative like this, you start to get to the tedious rolling the same dice over and over and not getting anywhere. Um, similar kinds of issues with, you know, like games that have armor saves and stuff like that. Stunning one another, they're too close in values and the six-sided dice are too unlikely to provide enough of a swing. I mean, the most we can get, say, a seven is a 12 point swing modified by the one point. Well, that means nobody's going to get an auto kill here in terms of the difference. Question comes up in play. I may need to look 
look at the errata for this. Uh, a so the restrictions on melee combat says a melee unit can only melee once per phase. A unit may be melee attack, blah, blah, blah. Elsewhere, there doesn't seem to be anything that absolutely says whether or not only melee units, i.e. the swords, can attack. I suspect that's the case. I really do. Um, however, okay, there we go. Sword and slinger, melee and fire, gotcha. So I'm guessing these bowmen are absolutely ref uh, uh, prohibited from actually marching up and hitting the enemy. I had counted on him being able to strike the enemy too, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So, um, this is the end of Arthur's melee combat, and you can see he didn't break much of the shield wall to begin with, but then over here he got some luck with some of his charges and got them through. And now Mordred gets to swing back. We'll see how, oh, what kind of effect that has. Uh, looks like he's got most of his units. And the interesting thing with this is you kind of want to pull your calf back, turn them around, and charge again. Of course, time is an issue, but <clears throat> especially if you're way behind the eight ball in terms of victory points. Um, but the possible exception to that is when you've got engaged shield wall units, you just want to keep bashing on them because they're going to deteriorate as they go. All right. Uh, Got to swap batteries and roll some more dread dice. We pull our hidden leader out of there. Yeah, we didn't want to fight Arthur. We found the one point differential against us was so painful. We're pretty sure a two point differential is just going to result in death. Oh, that's so painful. It ended up in a wounded and captured e loss. Um, so, I guess now uh, we move on to the next turn. And it's kind of funny because of the way the rallies happen at the beginning of the player turns means that you kind of don't see at the end of a turn the full ish situation with the battle. So for example, this leader is gonna still be there, but his troops are gonna run and they're gonna be off map lost. Um, we're gonna see the effects of these retreats taking place. That hasn't happened yet. And then Mordred gets to go. And what's kinda cool with Mordred going is he can swing these guys around, spin them, and then um, make some strikes from the back, and then also charge in with those. So he's going to have some possibility to kind of roll up the flank over here. And weird because it looked like Mordred was winning on this flank, but now uh, his archers aren't holding up against the heavy cav that's getting thrown against them. But on the other hand, because of this break, Mordred's going to be able to get a bit of a breakthrough and maybe roll up what had looked like the stronger flank, although I had shifted some forces over. At least I got the round table knights to throw back in. And I should have plenty of leaders to rally things. I think I made a serious error in letting these guys be in the front line. <laughs> At the beginning, uh, there was no reason for that. And that's a lot of points that got chalked up. Uh, as you can see, I'm protecting my lousy leaders by throwing them in the back. And I'll load this one up because it looks like it's gonna take more than one more than one video to cover this game. I mean, it doesn't have to, but <laughs> now that I have the joiner, but eh, I think an hour is long.